Tactical Combat Casualty Care for all combatants. This short lecture is not intended for medics. You guys have and need more knowledge, but the principles of TCCC are the same for everyone involved. Treat the casualty, prevent additional casualties, and complete the mission. This is just a rough guideline. Every situation requires the patient. Don't only go by the checklist. This way you'll kill somebody one day or really, really piss somebody off. Nothing is written in stone and if a guy is shot in the hand and you start cutting off his youth pro pants, which he bought himself, as the way you were taught in medical school, well, get ready for a slap with a good hand. So, here under fire, this is a face we're still being shot at. Like right now. Good medicine is bad tactics and the best medicine during a firefight is fire superiority. So that means there will be no bandages going on as we need the rifle downrange. So, we take cover and return fire. We should not be hasty and run to our casualty like a dumb medic in a Steven Spielberg movie. We need to find out if we have any more casualties, how many casualties do we have, and then establish a plan how to evacuate our casualties from point X. There are many ways around that. If we can get to him safely, we grab and go. A quick tourniquet application is better to do in some cover because it's not so simple as it sounds. But if you can't do that, at least apply direct pressure to the artery or do a stopgap to the wound. If we can't get to our guy, we try to scream, tell, radio him to move to cover. Apply self-fate. And expect our teammates to remain in the fight if able to. If we're not able to move our carity to a safe place, we roll it on the stomach. Let's say we're going into a building. First man goes down, and the last man has time to roll our carity on his stomach. With this, we do a sloppy A from the March algorithm, Area Management, which we'll cover in the next video. We generally don't do this in care under fire, but this is a simple way to make sure our casualty is not suffocating on his own tongue or blood. Sounds matter of fact, but we're buying some extra time while staying in an active situation, so we can eliminate the threat and come back for our guy when we can. Oh, and also, if our guy has a support weapon or mission sensitive items, switch his weapon with yours and get his backpack. That sums up care under fire, since we eliminated the hostile threat. Now we're going into the tactical field here, but that and the next. So, we are no longer under effect of hostile fire and have reached fire superiority. Now we can start caring for the casualty. This is known as tactical field care. At this point, we will be calling for a medevac, ASAP. We know things are going bad, so we start ringing in the bird. Next, we will start with a redistribution of resources, if you haven't done that already in the care under fire. And if a guy is carrying mission-sensitive items, we need those in safe hands. And also, in the event that we're giving our guy any painkillers and he's high as a kite, we really don't want him holding on to his weapon and grenades. Also, we need his ammo for our security detail. Remember, this can change at any given moment, so we're not out of the woods yet, so be careful before you start taking care of your casualties. Make sure the place is secure and maintain a 360 degree safety perimeter and as needed, do triage of the casualties. Oh yeah, if you find a casualty with polytrauma, in English, our guy is really fucked up, without a pulse, no respirations and other vital signs, we don't resuscitate, no CPR. Tactical field phase. Now let's jump right in into our assessment. We got our security set. I like to teach my guys the simple acronym MARCH, which stands for Massive Bleeding, Airway Management, Respiration, Circulation, Head Injury, Hypovolemia, and Hypothermia. And now let's start with Massive Bleeding. Basically, Massive Bleeding is 
Everything you see that's really bad, that's bleeding, you need to cover it. No small boo-boos. Uh, but first of all, if our guy put the tourniquet on and the care under fire face, we double check it. If it's on correctly, if it's on high and tight, okay, everything seems to be in order. If the tourniquet is not uh, holding, you put one next to it, side by side, cinch it in and leave both uh, in place. Okay, he did a good job, I'm a good medic. Now, check the neck, check the axe pockets, check the groin. If you see any blood, you cut the uniform, you expose the bleed. If it's bad, you pack it in with a combat gas or any other hemostatic agent. Okay, you do a visual sweep of his body, no bleeds. Okay, good. You always talk with your guy. Hey buddy, are you okay? Okay, say I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. What does that okay mean to us? That means that his airway is open. It's patent. We don't need to waste time uh, checking it. If he's making any sense in his words, like he's like, God damn son of a bitch or something like that, PC correct. That means that he's making sense. He's getting some blood into his brain. He's getting oxygen. That means he's not in shock at this moment. If he's doing like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna become an officer. Okay, he's apparently losing it. He's not getting enough oxygen in his brain. He's probably going into shock. If we haven't done that already, we take away his weapon, radio, grenades, so he doesn't do any damage. We take away his magazines, give it to the security detail because they need it. And that pretty much sums up the massive bleeding portion of our March protocol. Now we're going into A, airway management. If the patient is not talking with us, we need to open his airway. We need to clean it. Maybe he has some snooze in it. We need to listen here for a breathing. We can multitask and see the rise and fall of the chest. Okay, he's breathing with us. Okay, that's wonderful. If he's unconscious, we need to secure the airway. We can do that in uh, multiple different ways. We're gonna do it with an MPA, nasal pharyngeal airway, which is basically a nose uh, tube. Yes, it's funny, a tube in his body. We're gonna take it out of his eye pack. We take an MPA, we take our trusty lubricant. I'm not gonna make fun of him why he has lubricant in his eye pack. It can be used in many different ways. I hope it's being used only for the MPA. Bevel towards the septum. Okay, we check. Okay, he's breathing, awesome. Don't forget to tape it down. What we do if we don't have an MPA, we can put him in a recovery position. This is the least that we can do. The rule of thumb, if he's awake and can't breathe and we're forcing him to stay on his back and he doesn't want it, don't force him. Maybe he has facial trauma and the blood is pooling into his airway, lean him on his side. Okay, anything that helps him breathe. If he wants to stand up and the tactical situation permits it, he can stand up. Whatever helps him breathe. Okay, are you okay? Are you comfortable? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, that pretty much sums up the A portion from the March algorithm. Now we go into respiration. Now we're going into the R portion of our March algorithm, respiration. Basically, that means we're gonna check if we have any holes in the box. By the box, I mean from the nose to the belly button. If there's any holes, we put an occlusive dressing on. But first of all, we expose the chest. We check the neck. We check the armpits. We look for breathing, bilateral rise and fall of the chest. If we are too stressed out to hear or see breathing, 
we take our hands, we say no homo, and we feel for breathing. Okay, good bilateral rise and fall. Nice. Now we pray a bit. We go up. If we see any discoloration on the collarbone, probably is broken. We're not going to do any good if we find out, yes, exactly, it's broken. We just treat it and it's broken. No, it's okay. We just walk. Okay, nice. We go on one side of the rib cage. We just do a, just a bit of squeeze. We check if he's doing like a grimace. If he's doing like, ah, we stop. Okay, nice. If we did find a hole, was here. Use your hand. Put it on. Get an occlusive dressing. Open it up. Usually, I pre-pack my occlusive dressing with an NCD. Oh, I have troubles opening. What do you do? Don't be afraid to let it go. You're going to be faster taking out an occlusive dressing. Wipe it off and put it on, then like with this number or something like that. Or get a porter, put your hand here. Anybody can do it. Okay, we put this on. What do you do? You check, no suck, no blow. So, okay, we patched the hole. Now we're just gonna go for the rule of thumb again. If our patient is experiencing trouble breathing and uh, he has a hole in his chest that we put an occlusive dressing on, we put two and two together, he has a tension pneumothorax. We have to do a NCD, but that in a later video. All bad things come in two, so we have an entry hole, probably there's an exit hole. So we have to check the back. We do a body hug. Check it, okay. Okay, we don't see anything, good. If we see blood, we know it, but we're gonna check it later when we're checking his back. Now we're going to see circulation from our March protocol. First of all, we check our interventions or if they are still holding. Okay, everything seems to be in order. If we did any neck wounds, X pocket wounds, inguinal wounds, we double check it. Yeah, it's good. And if our hands are bloody, we wipe them off and we do the blood sweeps. If we see any blood, we take our scissors, we expose the wound and then decide what we're going to do with them. If it's a minor venous blood, small cut, don't worry about it for now. Just go forward. I think. Oh. Just a tip. Here I probably see blood. Expose it. It's just a minor cut. So now what we're gonna do, it's a minor cut, he has a tourniquet on. So the tourniquet is pretty much useless. So now we decide what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a compression bandage. We're gonna convert it. We don't know. That we're gonna cover in the next video. We finished our blood sweeps. Now we check his pulse. Okay, if we feel the radial, awesome. He's not in shock. If you don't feel the radial, check the carotid. He's alive. If you don't feel the radial pulse, that means he's in decompensated shock. He's not doing good. He's pretty much fucked up. Okay. Feel the skin, the color. Okay. 
tank warm and dry. Awesome. Now what we're gonna do, we have to turn it over to check his back. But first of all, what we're gonna check, if he has a broken thallus. We close the book and then we open it. If we see a grimace on his face at any time, we stop immediately. That tells us that he has a broken pelvis and we have to move him in another way, but that in another video. Now we check this, we need to prep our equipment. We're gonna turn you over, so pretty much what we need. Our litter for hypothermia, already heat. Before we saw an entry wound in his uh, chest, we prep our second halo, we prepped our equipment, but what happened beforehand, I broke my glove and because I know my buddy's sexual preference of women and small farm animals, I'm gonna put a fresh glove on. Okay, now we're gonna turn him on the side. We check for his downside wound. Okay, nothing noted. Check his neck. No step offs or deviations. Down. Okay. We prep our radio heat between his legs. So we do the hypothermia portion. Okay, one, two, three. Put him back in. Now we ask him, hey, buddy. How are you? You good? Good. Okay. We're assessing his level of consciousness. Then check his airway. Yeah, he's still breathing. I see rise and fall of the chest. He still has a radio pulse. Nice. LOC, ABC is done. Now interventions. We moved him. That's like an evasive thing that we did with his body. And before that, we did a couple of interventions on. Now we have to check them if they're still holding. Check the MPA. Okay, it's in. It was taped in. Okay, good breathing. Check his halo. No suck, no blow. Nice. Check his tourniquet. Yeah, still holding. Now let's do a bit of paperwork. Where's his TCCC card? Time for the cat. Note it on and note it on the TCCC card. And this you put somewhere on him that he's not gonna lose. On his hand, on his belt. Okay, the TCCC card goes with him. We note all interventions that we did on it. So the flight medic and the surgeon in the hospital has an easier job. Now that we put our guy on the litter, we checked his level of consciousness, ABCs and interventions. Now we go into H, which stands for hypovolemia, head injury and hypothermia. For hypothermia, we already prepped our ready heat. Also have pre-staged blanket. And we cover him up the best we can. If not, we improvise. We do something. We take our hat, we put it on him. If he has any wet clothes, we change them. Nothing works well if our casualty is cold. A bit of hypothermia is done. Check the head for head injuries. If it's something minor, we just bandage it up. But if you see blown out pupils, raccoon eyes, which basically means discoloration under his eyes. If you see something leaking out of his ears, something out of his nose, that's an indication that he might have traumatic vein injury. We pretty much can do a lot of things for him. Uh, if he is not in shock, we can raise his shoulders and head for about 30 degrees, keep him breathing, and that's in our toolbox 
of help that we can give them. Okay, now what? You're not a medic and you need to cover hypovolemia. We suspect that he's going into shock and we need to fight it. We need to give him an IV or an IO. But do we have the capability? Do we have the knowledge, the skill? But that in another video. We pack the patient up, but we can still help. We give him his combat pill pack if he can swallow it. Can you swallow? Yeah, okay. He can swallow, luckily. That's nice. Beforehand, in the March protocol, we were saving a life, but now we're just making it a bit better. With the combat pill pack, we're taking care of the antibiotic portion and a minor part of analgesia. Now we're just dressing the burns, the small cuts, maybe doing a tourniquet conversion, uh, immobilizing anything that needs to be mobilized, but if you don't know how to do this or anything more other than march, remember, probably we have comms up, so we call our tactical command, our next level of care, so they can help us, guide us through all the procedures that we still can do to our patient. Okay, now we're waiting for the medevac. We fill out his TCCC card. We prep our guy for transport, so our blanket doesn't go flying off in the rotor. He put his glasses on, and that's pretty much it. Last thing, enemy combatant. Sometimes we didn't do a good job, and now we had to treat our wounded enemy. Oh. Because the rules of engagement dictate it, and because it's the right thing to do. But safety first, immobilize and secure the enemy, because he's still trying to kill us. Remember to watch part three, where we cover a couple of basic interventions. How to do a tourniquet conversion. Okay, now we did all the things in March, and when we reassessed the wound, we found out there's just a minor flesh wound. So, now there's a decision to be made. Are we gonna convert the tourniquet? Are we gonna let the tourniquet to be converted by a medic? And let him endure the pain? You want the pain? Yep, why not? Okay. <laughs> we're gonna decide that we're gonna convert the tourniquet. I could use my scissor right now and cut away off his pants that he bought himself, but I'm gonna be a good guy, not gonna do this. First, I'm gonna do a small Power ball with the combat gauze. Find the wound, find the deepest part, and start packing it in. Buddy, you're okay? You're gonna be good. You're gonna be one man hopping, but you're gonna be good. Okay, you're gonna help me right now. You're gonna hold pressure here, okay, brother? Hold pressure here for at least three minutes because it says on the label. Hold pressure here. I'm taking out your Israeli bandage. I like it that it's up to date. Okay, just remove a bit. Good, good, good. I have it, I have it, I have it. Okay, help me hold it, brother. Okay. Feel good? Okay. We are converting the tourniquet because our patient is not in shock. We can monitor the wound. And also, the tourniquet is not controlling an amputation, which is pretty much redundant. How to release the tourniquet? There are multiple ways how to skin this cat. Some people say that we remove the windlass a quarter turn by minute. Okay, some like to do that. 
the way I teach it is just to release it all together and then check if it starts bleeding. Okay. Let it flow. I'm removing his shoes so I can check his pulse so I didn't do a really nice tourniquet, a comfy one. Nice. Feel good? Okay. I don't, it stinks. Remove the tourniquet just a bit and we try to put it two to three inches above the wound. So if it starts bleeding again, we have the means to stop the bleeding again. Just make sure we're not putting it directly on the knee. Good. When this is off, you feel great, brother? Yeah, right. Any dizziness? Nope. Conversion of a tourniquet should be done no later than two hours from the point of injury. That pretty much how you do it. You note it on the TCCC card, and that's it. He's a happy camper. How to do an NCD. Okay, we did our cuff, we did our tactical field care. We had a hole in his box. We plugged the hole with an occlusive dressing. But now we suspect tension pneumothorax. What is tension pneumothorax? Pretty much is we have a hole in our chest. We disrupted the ballots inside and now the pressure is building up. The pressure that is building up, it's pushing on our all major vessels that are inside and on, on our heart. It's pressuring on our good lung and we can't breathe. What are we going to do? We're going to do a needle chest decompression. We take our 14 gauge needle, choose our site. We're going to choose the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, lateral to the nipple line. Take our alcohol, we clean it. Take our needle and advance the catheter. We advance the catheter down to the hub, wait five to 10 seconds. In the meantime, we listen for a whoosh. Okay, hopefully we hear a whoosh. Start removing the needle. And now check if our patient is breathing better. Okay. Breathing turned a bit to normal. Nice. Okay, we did the NCD. Our patient is feeling better. This is not the final solution. Our patient needs an immediate evac because he needs another hole in his body. It's not that funny. He needs a chest tube. Sometimes multiple needle Ds are gonna be needed for our patient, maybe because of a prolonged evac time. Maybe the first one is gonna get clogged, but just get a new one and jab it right next to it. Okay, if the first one is getting clogged, we just try to unclog it. We grab the NCD, we go next to it and quarter turn. So we just try to unkink it and then reassess our patient. But what do we do if we plugged our hole with an occlusive dressing, but we don't have an NCD? We don't use our little trusty Swiss army knife and make a hole here to alleviate the pressure. We just grab one end of the occlusive dressing and then pull it back as needed and try to burp the wound. It's not gonna do like a Homer Simpson burping sound, but you just try to alleviate the pressure. Okay, we hear something. Burp. Press it back. Reassess, no suck, no blow. And then check our patient. Did it work? 
Yeah, he's breathing better. With every reassessment, we go close to the NCD, quarter turn, listen for a whoosh. And why am I doing this? This is our primary site. The secondary site is the fifth intercostular space, mid axillary line. This, it's really, really important to do a reassessment because it gets easily clogged because of the stretchers and because of the hands. And that pretty much sums up how you do an NCD. How to give a peripheral IV. We're not gonna discuss why we give it because we can give it for all sorts of reasons, dehydration, medication, yada, yada, yada. But let's just talk about the most uh, important aspect of anything that we do, preparation. First, we prepare our equipment, all the essentials that we need. You can buy a commercial kit, but I like to make my own kits. Check the fluids, color, clarity, expiration date. This you should be doing already in the base, not here. Hey brother, you're gonna help me? Just hold it. We prepared our equipment. We need our sharps container so we don't jam our needles into the soil. Now, we prepped everything for our procedure. Expect the tubing. Clamp it. Open. Fill the drip chamber. Flush the tubing. Okay. Close it. Okay, minor bubbles, that's okay. He's a big boy, he can deal with it. This. There are tegaderm. We good? It's a bad sign, he's not talking with us. Alcohol. Take my needle. South. Okay. Good. Bevel up. 30 degrees. Close it. Drop the bag. Okay, back pressure blood. Raise it up. Still dripping. Wonderful. Set the flow. Can you raise it higher? You're strong. Okay. Good. And this is pretty much how I do a peripheral IV. Now we're just gonna add what did we do. First, we chose the site. We cleaned the site with uh, alcohol. In a real situation, we wouldn't do that, but yeah. Call me a lousy medic. Then we took our 18 gauge catheter, we inspected it, then put slight tension on the skin, go with the vein, 30 degrees, insert, wait for flash. When we see flash, we advance two to three millimeters, lower the needle, and then advance the catheter. Then we put the occlusion in the vein, Took out the needle, put it in our sharps container, took our tubing, connected it in, checked for patency, secured it, and voila. 
This was just a rough familiarization and at no means can replace proper medical training. But we do hope that you found it useful. Stay safe.